Um, like I think one paper, you know, we can, I think, I think I saw in the chat, uh, James White was mentioned rhizophagy, but also too, the other mention was that his, you know, some of his work, which highlight the fact that uh, fusarium, um, you know, fusarium oxysporum is like a tenacious fungus, a plant pathogen, like tropical type two is a strain that's killing so many of the Cavendish bananas because they're all monoculture. Um, apparently fusarium, when it's in the soil by itself and in the distressed soil, it'll be an opportunistic and tenacious pathogen. But it turns out some of the work was that if, if uh, pseudomonas was introduced into the soil with fusarium, um, the role changes, but not changes where the fungus is now just a decomposer, but actually a mutualist, right? And we're realizing there are these bacterial fungal interactions in the soil. There's even some theories that, um, you know, like we all have candida on and in our body, right? But then some people have a really gnarly candida outbreak or, you know, athlete's foot, like tinea, tinea, uh, tinea pettis, what everyone has, or, you know, a more aggressive tinea, tinea versicolor, which actually kind of blots on the skin. And so one thing we're realizing is that um, when you take a pretty heavy course of antibiotics, let's say you have an infection, uh, let's say you got bit by a tick and you want to kind of knock down the, the aspects, you actually may be doing more harm to your internal microbial ecology, but also the micro microbial ecology of the fungi or other organisms in your body. And we're realizing that this dysbiosis that happens, right, this, this shifting towards a monoculture have upstream effects, right? So it's funny, given the fact that we were once microbial life that then went through a symbiogenesis, right? And we crystallize our genome, right? We, we, we stabilize the number of genes we had and crystallize our metabolism, which is complex of genes being expressed the microbiome modulates it. It's where a lot of the general kind of theory, like the general kind of hypothesis of a lot of the microbiome theory is not just for people, but also for microbial ecology in the soil with plants. So it's interesting that there's these up and downstream effects when you reduce to an organism by itself and view it, okay, that's a pathogen, or maybe it's just a host that is no other option and rather than keel over and die, it's going to survive. And even too in hospitals, right? In environments where, you know, we over sterilize and it's important for an operating room and things like that, but we actually might be breeding a lot of these superbugs because think about this, microbes, they reproduce rapidly, right? It's the reason why life also says it kills 99.9% .9 rather than 100 is because there's some genetic diversity in that population that will overcome it. And then through kind of expansion of populations from that seed or just random DNA floating around horizontal gene transfer, which happens all the time, bacteria that are constantly modifying themselves on every surface all the time, it's a strategy, you lead to these conditions, like for example, like Candida aureus or some really nasty antibiotic res uh, resistant bacteria, the only viable food source in an environment that is so heavily sterilized may be the macroorganism that sterilizes the environment, right? So you have to understand these organisms have been on this planet for so much longer than we have. We've only been around as modern humans for like 300,000 years, you know, and we're kind of, we're hubristic. We think we're hot shit. When in reality, the organisms have been on this planet for geological timeframes, right? Not ecology, right? Geological timeframe. They got it a little more figured out. And they're pretty robust. So it's kind of, it's kind of unwinding the human centered perspective that, you know, we are human. We can have this thought and be cognitive, cognitive of it and conceptualize, but we have to be aware that, you know, we don't exist in a vacuum. We're not islands, you know? Um, yeah, so it's kind of, you get a little more philosophical in that route. So, you know, well, you know, it's, it, it brings up a very good, interesting point is that when you have that microbial diversity or cellular diversity, you are more suited to deal with, uh, potential external pressures in the form of these, uh, muted, mutated cells or pathogens or whatever. And, you know, it goes back to the old understanding of, well, if you, if you sterilize everything, the bad guys are going to get there first. So we, we've got to maintain that, that diversity and, and that, which includes yeah. pathogens. We need you know, like, 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 so this is the idea is that, you know, you, you maybe want a probiotic, you want an enrichment culture, right? So this is one of the big things I think even with people that make cheese and dairy, right? There's a really good example. Um, there's a really good food, food documentary, but a highlighted tale that like there are nuns in Connecticut and like they're basically make cheese. It's, they live, live a monastic life, like a, like a the convent or the monastery, right? Very simple. You make your own food and to comply with, uh, I think the state and also uh, FDA uh, food production standards, they, they were required to use stainless steel vats for, for their fermentation process. And what happens is the quality of cheese changed, right? It wasn't keeping as long. And pretty much they had someone that came over from Europe and explained to them saying, no, 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 you need to use wood. We can't use it. We'll get shut down. No, no, no. You want the container for your cheese to be like the inside of a cow. So wood, right? All these porous aspects. And even too, there's a lot of surface area where, you know, like um, if you have like your favorite beer sign, right? Or mug or favorite crock, you get a biofilm on it. Those microbes move into the ceramic pores and they basically establish that and protect it. It's like enrichment culture. Um, so when you kill, 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 right? Heck, just use a little soap. Soap's pretty great. Um, you know, there's some applications like sterilizing like surgical equipment. Yeah, if someone's going to be putting something in my veins or cutting me open, yeah, I, I kind of want it to be like clean as possible. But, you know, um, but there are ways where we can kind of like use enrichment culture to pre-inoculate or kind of almost like a protective coating and film, which may include these biofilms that help them as well. So this is an emergent kind of property of as we classify these different kind of roles and connections. It's, it's like that yeah. blue cheese, that stinky, stinky fungi. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, what is it? Uh, penicillium, uh, Rocafort. Something like that. Yeah. Stilton, Leave, you wanna, yeah. yeah. Leave, you want to throw something in on that one? Yeah. Uh, well, two things. First, when you're talking about if you sterilize everything and the bad guys get there first, it also can be that you sterilize everything you actually, you can create more bad guys because we've talked about horizontal gene transfer a few times. And some of the types of genes that are most associated with plasmids or like, you know, kind of small little pieces of genetic information, the bacteria will pass back and forth. Antibiotic resistance genes are often carried on these genetic elements. So with the horizontal gene transfer, different organisms passing new, basically passing new abilities back and forth, kind of like, you know, here's your download, here's your you know new piece of software to deal with this new program. 